Luna. This is Luna. This is Roxy. And Hank, who we primarily worked with during this session, is outside. And this is their roadmap to success. Um, basically, in this video, uh, I just want to kind of summarize all the things we covered in the session. Um, uh, Hank is the, the primary reason the Guardians uh, called me in because uh, he was adopted about six weeks old. Well, not because, but because of his reactions to humans. And uh, basically, he is uh, one of the other family members' uh, dog who has actually moved to out of state. And so they're not sure if he's gonna, uh, if Hank's gonna stay here or go there. It kind of depends on how he does. Um, I can't really give you a, a fair assessment after only seeing him for three hours. Um, I was able to hand feed him. I could probably pet him at this point. I'm not pushing my luck. Uh, but uh, I don't really think of him as an aggressive dog. I think of him as a kind of a spoiled, petulant dog that was under-socialized and is under-exercised. So we have a lot of things contributing factors here. So uh, now uh, the Guardians have had a couple things going on with dogs. She's from Tully's, which is uh, supports puppy mills. You should never buy a dog from a pet store. Tully's or any other, because they take the puppies away, typically from the mothers when they're about five weeks old. The uh, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth, uh, fifth, sixth, and seventh week are really, really important in terms of development. Um, and so you take a puppy that it was in a great, great situation with all its family members and loving and, and attention and the warmth and comfort and all that security that comes from that confidence that comes from that security, um, and then is taken away transported, which is a traumatic experience, then put in a cage at a pet store somewhere. They don't get really sit, a lot of human attention or contact. Um, and a lot of times they develop uh, potty training issues. They poop and pee in the kennel because they're not taken out often enough and they just gotta go. Um, they don't get socialized around a lot of people, which is why I'm not a big fan of getting a farm dog that's raised outside because you want to, your dog is going to live inside. If you're going to get it on and it's going to live on a farm, that's fine. But you want your dog to have practice doing whatever it is. And so um, uh, Hank, I believe, was gotten at, from a breeder that's nearby. Uh, but it was not, the dog, the dad was kind of aggressive uh, or charged the guardians. Um, it was, uh, he, they let the breeder let him go at six weeks, which is a big red flag. A good breeder is going to almost insult you by asking you questions, ex asking you to see pictures of your yard, uh, checking character references and things like that, because they really care about their animals. They want to make sure they don't get bounced around. If somebody's priority is get, get, get it out of here and get, collect money from you, go away, find a different breeder. Um, I've seen people, but I have a deposit down. You're going to have this dog for 10, 15 years. And if you have a dog that is raised in an environment where the mother is stressed out when she was pregnant, she's going to pr produce puppies that are going to be more stressed out. Then the puppies are now going to be raised in that stressful environment. That's going to make them more stressful. And then they left at six weeks old or <coughs> a puppy mill, uh, le leaving early, even earlier than that. They're not getting... <coughs> Dotson. <coughs> Come here. Come here. Now, if I give her a treat for this, I would be rewarding this behavior. So what I want to do is stop the behavior and ask us for a sit, sit, sit. So we had a, at least three to five seconds of stoppage of the barking. Then I get re redirect the dog into doing something. Then I rewarded the dog for doing that. But the motivation, pulling the treat out, stopped and distracted the dog from doing the other things we didn't want. So... Um, you don't want to get a dog from uh, from a breeder that's going to let that's not going to ask you a lot of questions or is more interested in moving the dog and collecting money than they are asking about you um, or get it uh, if it's under eight weeks old um, and you definitely never want to get it from a, a uh, from a pet store because they support puppy mills and people and what they're counting on is you go in there and see that dog behind the cage and be like oh but I'm going to rescue him that is every single thing they intentionally want you to do and it sucks you don't want that to puppy I'd love to save every puppy on the planet but at the same time if I'm paying and I'm supporting the people who are doing this, I might pay them and I might now give them the funds to do this for 24 more dogs, more puppies. And each time that happens, it, it dovetails like that. So you have to break the chain. And this is why we're not big fans of puppy mills here at Dog Gone Problems. Um, also, don't get a puppy too early. You don't want to get too late either. The Guardian asked me about that. And if you get a puppy um, like it's four or five months, puppies are born fearless, literally, because they can't move. Their eyes and ears are closed and they can't move around. If something was fearful or they're afraid of something, that would be psychologically devastating. So Mother Nature doesn't add in the capacity for fear until they're at least three weeks old. And she just doles out a little bit each day. And sometime between they get three and four months is uh, when it ends and it normalizes or maximizes. During that period, it's called the critical socialization period. It is the most important developmental period a puppy goes through. And basically, uh, anything that the puppy is exposed to during the critical socialization period in a good way, the rest of their life they're comfortable with. Now, um, if, let's say, I put a treat in my puppy's mouth and then my neighbor two doors down starts his Harley right after I put the treat in its mouth. 
Well, now it startles the dog a little bit, but he has something positive happening. And then nothing bad happened. Then I might have the neighbor come like one house closer and then do the same thing. Pop a treat in my dog's mouth and then he starts the Harley. And then he turns it off. And then eventually I have him come and start the Harley right next to my puppy. And I do the same thing. Puppy just now is look, kind of looking at him as chewing the treat and not startled. Because we're creating a positive association. This is why the critical socialization period is often referred to as a single exposure period. Um, that was three uh, exposures, but you might only have to expose a puppy to something once or twice during that critical socialization period. The rest of their life, that they're like, I'm cool with that. I have a lot of clients tell me, my dog is racist. Your dog's not racist. You just never met someone with light colored skin or dark colored skin when they were a puppy. So anything they're not exposed to during the critical socialization period, the rest of their life, they're very standoffish and wary around. So if you get, if you have kids, you want to get a puppy that is going to be around a lot of kids when it's during the critical socialization period because so that is normal. They're comfortable and relaxed and confident because of the experience they have around little kids. I have on uh, my website, Quest, uh, I have a section called Quest Ed. I have a post on the critical socialization period where I made an Excel checklist of 344 experiences to get a dog. From playing an instrument to having a woman's uh, uh, skirt blow in the, in the breeze to somebody having dreadlocks to putting a face mask on or face paint, uh, Harley vacuum cleaners, brooms, snapping a bag open. There's so many things you would never even consider. That's why I put together that list. Anyway, so we have basically a dog that didn't have those benefits, also didn't go to puppy school. Puppy school is huge. Well, I'm going to say this and then I'll get off the puppy riff. But basically puppies, um, because they're very open, uh, when they're, uh, also when they're puppies, they give off a pheromone. And the adult dogs, as long as they're not aggressive towards that dog, can smell that pheromone and then they'll let the puppy get away with more than they normally would because they're like, ah, it's just a little guy. Well, your puppy is practicing behavior and creating behavior patterns, essentially, in his brain. And so if your puppy is only around adult dogs, the adult dogs smell and they're like, ah, he's just being a little stinker because he's a puppy. Well, your puppy is practicing acting like a stinker. Then later on, he gets around, uh, the, the pheromone wears off when it matures or it gets around other dogs uh, or puppies that are the same, well, puppies is the reason why. But if they get later on, it wears off and then they're around other dogs and they act the same way that they got away with because they had the pheromone, now they don't have the pheromone, that might cause the other dog to bite or attack or do something negative to your dog. Now your dog has practiced an unbalanced behavior, it's developed bad social skills, and it creates a lot of problems. And this is a common mistake I have a lot of people, I know my puppy doesn't need so cup puppy class because he's friendly, he loves everybody. It is not your puppy. It is the same developmental period every puppy goes through. And then these people call me at four months, they're like desperate, like my dog is fearful of everything. Hey, I'm happy to help you. But now we, I have to come to your house and instead of being a single exposure period, we might have to expose your dog, your puppy to it two, three, four, 500 times. The number of repetition, Having a puppy to begin with is difficult. It takes a lot of time. If you have to spend all your time undoing all these problems because you have a breeder who didn't know what the hell they were doing or somebody pulled it out of a puppy mill, you're spending all the time instead of getting above zero, you're just trying to get back to zero. If you have a puppy that's balanced and calm and you take a puppy school, now you're building skills. We teach 15 different tricks and commands in our puppy classes. Those puppies are now developing better confidence and skill and they're developing social skills because in puppy class they're around other puppies the same age they all have the pheromone but the other puppies have the pheromone going too they don't really care and they will correct and nip the other puppy for doing something inappropriate and help the puppy develop good positive social skills okay so this is uh i'm gonna whatever time mark this is mark this because you guys are going to watch this video multiple times this is kind of the puppy stuff that's really proceeding the rest of the stuff is going to help you guys all right, so um, uh, it'll all be helpful, but this will be specific for Hank. So um, the guardians were asking if Hank should go to stay uh, with the other uh, family member. Um, because of the environment that I've been told, probably a better idea for Hank to stay here at least temporarily, if not longer, because if that person is single and kind of at a younger uh, point in their life, they're gonna be really active, probably not gonna have the time to exercise. Younger people probably have more time and uh, uh, energy to do it, but if he's lunging everywhere, then it limits where you can take him. And uh, we would need to build up his social skills and confidence by doing the behavior adjustment training, the bat training that we went over in the video above. And we might need to set up another follow-up session or two just to do more bat training. Um, let me see, what else did we go over? We went over the importance of exercise. I think he's not a high energy breed, but he's definitely under exercise. And just because he likes running around the backyard, that's not the most efficient way of exercising him. I pulled out a laser, he seemed interested in laser, so have him chase the laser around, um, throwing the treats up and down the stairs as I talked about off camera. Uh, remember, count the number of up downs. So if you uh, throw it down and have him come back and do it with an empty stomach the first time, and then count each number of down ups as one. 
and then maybe he does 25. And after 25, he lays down the floor, down the basement. He's like, I'm not coming back up anymore. Now we know what his maximum number is. Then we might practice like 12 or 15 three times a day. Exercise for dogs is best sprinkled throughout the day rather than just once in the morning, once in the evening. We want to do it about every two to four hours. For him, he's probably closer to the four hour range. But if he gets really mischievous or naughty or something like that, we want to make sure that we beat him in the punch. And that's why we do the exercise journal. So we start noticing every time it's longer than three hours and 28 minutes, that's when he starts getting lungy or barky or whatever it is. So now we're just going to start exercising him every three hours. Also, we could put him in a position to succeed before I have a guest come over, like you talked in the video above. Make sure he exercises first and has about 15, 20 minutes before the guest comes on the door. Also, um, another little trick, and I talked about this in the video above, we have the two dogs in here. They're both kind of relaxed. Uh, uh, Rosie is right here at my feet. She was uh, asleep, and then I moved, and it kind of got her a little bit offset. And Luna's over there. So what, what you want to do is every once in a while... This is happening because this sound is associated with somebody coming through the door. You can't see it, but Luna's going now to check the front window. She's the insecure dog, so she's barking over here to raise the alert. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you. Thank you. So about 10% of dogs, Rosie's clearly not one of them, you say thank you, and she'll stop barking. Um, if it moves, that's because that's Luna sniffing the camera from behind. Um, but so nobody's going to the door. Nobody's coming through the door here. Um, so there's no excitement. This is a great way to desensitize your dogs. And once they settle down and they're not doing anything, they're watching TV and they're nice and relaxed, reach over and knock on the, on the a table next to you or knock on the wall. And so again, I talked about this in the video above, but we desensitize the dog to not barking or reacting when people come to the door. Because sometimes we hear this noise and it doesn't have anything to do with the excitement of people coming inside. Um, so the dogs basically are under-exercised, and that's contributing factors. So start the exercise journal for a month, play around with the elements, and keep on grading at the end of the, each day, and then play around with the elements. Add a couple more repetitions or a whole extra exercise, and keep throwing those in until you, the dogs grade out with an A grade. Now you know what exercise they need to succeed. And also, um, keep in mind that each dog's going to be unique. Rosie is older, and she's a smaller dog, so she might need less exercise than the others. Um, and so just finding whatever they need to succeed is going to make it easier. And one of the guardians works from home, so it should be easy to go up, downs, and the stairs or whatever the case may be. All right, so uh, the other thing we talked about were rules. The dogs really don't have any rules. Dogs go through life probing to determine where boundaries and limits are, and that lack of rules can confuse the dog into thinking that it is our peer or that it is responsible for us. But if a dog thinks it's responsible for us, but we don't listen to the dog when it tries to warn us or correct us, that stresses the dog out more cause the dog to be more proactive in terms of its uh, reaction or blustering or whatever it is. So the dog's like, well, my humans aren't listening to me when I tell them, warning, don't answer the door. There might be somebody taking advantage of you. And you're not listening to me. You open the door anyways. Now I have to go jump on this person or nip or bark at them and let them know, hey, even though my guardians are gullible, I'm in charge around here. And so that causes the dog to get more and more stressed. And that leads to, it becomes a big vicious cycle. So by incorporating rules and structure, we can help the dog start to identify as being in more of a follower's mindset. And that gives them more confidence and more comfort in being able to do, uh, just to relax and go back to being a dog. Now, Rosie, and specifically, I noticed the guardian tried to call her over. She doesn't like going to the kitchen, probably partially because it's a hardwood floor and she's a little dog and uh, her breed, uh, they don't have the best circulation in their paws. And they don't want to lay on the cool surface. So make sure there's a couple of places for her to lay on um over there but also the guardians have snatched her every time you snatch a dog or snatch to reach the collar you tell the dog you are right not to trust me because look i proved it by snatching you i always want the dog to do the work so i showed the guardian how to help rosie feel more comfortable so she can eventually reach down and pick the dog up and pick and carry it around but you have to build that up to that so the way i did that was i basically was giving her a treat and when i give her the treat i have my other hand here when the dog's head is here and taking the treat i just move my hand a little bit and the first time I did it, Rosie moved away. She said, I don't trust you. So I waited for her to come back and we did it again. And this time I just went like this, much smaller movement. I did this for a while, then I went like this. And each time I'm putting a treat in her mouth, then I'm moving my hand. And eventually I was moving a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And eventually I was able to touch her. The first time I touched her, it started a little, a little bit, but the second time she was okay. So we're preceding the movements with something good happening. And this is something you do with Hank as well. If a guest is in here and Hank's on the, in the kitchen and the, Hank, and the guest is going to go up and use the bathroom over there, have a bunch of treats handy. Give them a, one of these treat pouches full of uh, treats and just say, okay, I'm going to get up and go to the bathroom, take a treat, throw it in the kitchen. I didn't make it in the kitchen, but throw it in the kitchen. Luna will get it. And when, the, when Hank goes to get it, 
Then the person gets up and walks away. So we're preceding the movement. Hank's going to bark and say, I didn't give you permission to stand up. That's basically what he's saying. So we're preceding it by throwing a treat over there. There we go. And, uh, and then while he's looking that up, then I move. So every time this guy gets up, he moves. Well, I get a treat though. That doesn't make it so bad. So if you know you got out your car and there's a weird guy next to your car and he says, hey man, uh, I know this is going to sound weird, but I have a car fetish. Would you mind if I opened your door for you? And you're like, you're weird. And you unlock your door and he opens it up. And right as, right as he's about to close your door, he throws a $100 bill in there, closes the door and runs away. Well, next time you see that guy and he asks to open your door, you're probably going to be like, sure. So it's the same sort of principle. So I throw the treat and then I get up. And then I stand up. And then when the dog licks it up, he starts growling. I throw another treat and I take a step. I could do this step by step or take a, throw it over there, throw it further away. He's got to go get it. And then I walk away. But, you know, so you don't have to do each individual step. Might not be a bad idea in some situations, but in some situations, just throw it a little further so the dog moves away and then they go get it. Um, also, uh, if the guest is kind of hanging out here and the dog stops barking, if she's barking, don't even look. Don't look at him, excuse me, not her. And then as soon as the dog sits, take out a treat and throw it over there. Or if the dog moves away from the fence and stops barking, throw a treat. So again, we're, we're saying as soon as you stop challenging, barking at the guest, or if you move away from the guest, treats fall from the sky. This is a form of operant conditioning. It's one of the ways that dogs learn. And just creating a positive association for the dog to do the behavior and activity, in this case, that we want, like moving away from the guest. Um, all right, so uh, we went over some rules to incorporate because uh, for dogs, if they see us acting like leaders, one of the ways we do that is by enforcing rules consistently. And uh, being consistent is really important. Remember, I talked to the guardians off camera about human psychology versus dog psychology. We tend to think of breaking a rule as a, as a reward, but it actually confuses dogs when it, we're incorporating rules. So remember, rules need to be in place for 30 days minimum or as long as the problem's still going on. 30 days minimum. And all my clients here is, you just said 30 days, and they're waiting for the 30 days and they're done. It might be 90 days, it might be 120 days, it might be 300 days, it might be never. You might decide, I don't like the dogs in the furniture at all. There's okay. Now, I have videos on my website on how to teach a dog to go to the dog bed. And so if you want to do that, let me know. And I like to give each dog bed its own designation. So I can say, go to uh, Phoenix, go to Denver, go to Los Angeles. And I'm naming the dog beds city names or whatever it is. So message me if you want to, if you want to go over how to do that. And I can share a video link for you for those things. Um, let me see. Some of the rules we went over, besides not, not being allowed on the furniture, uh, getting X mats and tinfoil can be the uh, contraptions that you can use to keep the dogs off the furniture when you're gone. Um, and then it would be invitation per, uh, an invitation per exception and only for good behavior. Um, okay. And so I'd probably do the same thing with the bed as well and just get a dog bed in the bedroom so the dogs can sleep there and use the same reward motivation that, uh, just, uh, if you just go to doggoneproblems.com, uh, click on dog training tips on the right side of the page, there's a search box, just type in dog bed. And, I'll, and it'll come up right up to where I've done a video. Look for a one where it has the video where I throw the treats on the dog bed. It'll show you how to do that. Anytime we take away the furniture, I always like to do the dog bed at the same time. And I like to get dog beds from Groupon. I find they're the cheapest place to get them. I like the Sealy Posturepedic or the Memory Foam versions. They're not really, they're branded by those companies. They don't actually manufacture them, I don't think. But it's just, it's not a really expensive bed. It's just the way that it's made. And I get one with, it's a light gray, light cream or white and no pattern on it. And I like the ones that are like a cushion, kind of like this, as opposed to like some of them are look really comfy and fluffy like a comforter. Problem is when you leave treats on there, it might be in the crevice, they might not see it. That's why I want a light color, no pattern, and just a foam one that you can unzip. I had a dog that peed on one last, yes, last night. I was able to unzip it, wash it, and then put the foam back in. And uh, yeah. So, um, all right, so not being allowed in the furniture, sit before I let you enter out the door. Go to the door, say sit once. If the dog doesn't sit within three seconds, walk away, sit down somewhere. Wait one minute after one minute and set a timer for one minute. Go back to the door and tell it to sit again. If it doesn't sit this time, I'll walk away for two minutes, next time for four minutes, then for eight minutes, but sit down away every time you walk away. If the dog comes and barks and paws you, whatever, ignore it. Don't say a word. And as soon as you go and tell the dog to sit and it sits, that door opens up. That becomes the reward. After a while, your dog will sit at the door as its way of saying, I like to go outside. And if I go and say sit and Luna sits and the other two dogs don't sit, I would open the door and let Luna out and not let the other two out, dogs out. I'll be like, hey, knuckleheads, you want to go outside? You got to do what Luna did and sit down. I pay based on performance from now on. Um, and eventually you do it with both directions, in and out. Um, let me see. I, I recommend putting down some painter's tape and then not allowing the dogs in the, in the kitchen or around the dining room table um, when they are eating. 
And if you go to the dog gun problems uh, section of my website, uh, dog training tips, on that search box on the right, you can put invisible boundary or invisible boundary or uh, I think invisible probably will pull up some videos. I have a couple with a great Dane where I do this and I set the dog up to, to practice this. Maybe you have somebody come in here with a snack and the other guardian practices helping the dog stay outside the boundary. That's much easier than trying to do it when it's a real guest eating some something and you're trying to make the dog go away and there's just too many things going on. Set the dog up for success by practicing the behavior in the easiest capacity first. There we go, yes. Um, all right, let me see what else. Um, uh, so there's, there's some rules. Um, don't, don't go out and let the dog go out ahead of you if you're going out the door. Don't let it run up down the stairs ahead of you if, if you're going down or down the hallway or through the doorway, whatever it is. Make the dog wait after you so the dog identifies being a follower rather than the leader. Get in a habit of not walking around your dogs if they are standing. If they're standing, walk through them as if they are invisible. Bump in, and don't do a shove walk when you get to them. Walk into them as if they're not even there. So when you bump into them, they after a while, they're like, the humans are not lock, looking out for us anymore. We got to get the hell out of their way. And that's a follower's mindset is I'm going to watch you and get out of your way versus expecting you to watch me and get out of my way. Um, let me see. Um, uh, feeding. Make sure the guardians are feeding the dogs in the order of their rank one at a time and the humans eating something first. Um, dog feeding would be another thing to search on my website um, and, and I show you how to keep dogs out of the kitchen. I also talk a lot about setting them up by helping them practice microwaving a piece of mic bacon or something like that we talked about off camera. Um, so microwave that and that way the dog can smell it, you can practice pretending like you're cooking and then when the dog lays down outside the boundary, that's when you start your actual cooking. Same thing with a meal at the, t at the dinner table, microwave a piece of roast beef, everybody sit down, cut it up, put it on your plates and act like you're cutting up and every time the dog breaks the boundary, we use those escalating consequences to move the dog away. Escalating consequences, you search for that, um, on my website I have a lot of video, uh, I mentioned escalating consequences in most of my write-ups. So it, when you're on my website and you, the idea to find a training video, it's going to be in the title. So if it talks about rules and structure in the title or something like that, that's probably one. Or you might just type for uh, search for escalating consequences, but I wrote, write that in almost every write-up. So if you have problems finding a video for those escalating consequences, just message me, I can send you one. Uh, let me see, what else? Uh, so the humans are gonna eat first and the dogs eat in the order of their rank. Use passive training to assign a command word for each dog's uh, command word. So each dog has a pasta or sushi or your favorite restaurant or your favorite meal or whatever it is. I say grub chow, feast, and eat. I don't like using eat, but somebody assigned that word. That wasn't me. Use fun command words whenever possible, especially because of Hank's issue. If we say crash and the dog flops down the ground, people smile and laugh. It's a nice, light energy. That will help the dog. If the dog, its energy is all tense, if people are worried and waiting, that causes the dog to think, well, they're all tense, something must be wrong. Well, if everybody's laughing and jovial, that helps the dog be laughing and relaxed and jovial itself. Not necessarily jovial, but relaxed. Um, let me see, I went over petting with a purpose and passive training. I have videos for those as well. Uh, the quick synopsis, petting with a purpose is if I want to pet the dog or the dog's initiating contact with me, I tell it to do something else. Sit, it's already sitting, ask it to sit over here or lay down. Don't practice shake because it just don't practice it. It costs them more problems than you need. Um, so what you're telling the dog is if you want my attention, you have to pay for it through uh, really saying please or thank, please by sitting or laying down to ask me for attention rather than pawing at me. And if I just want to pet the dog, I'm still going to tell the dog to sit. If it doesn't sit, then I lean back and I lose interest. And I go about you know checking my phone uh, for the stock market or watching TV or whatever it is I want to do. I'm not going to repeat my command. The more you repeat it, the less you mean it. And you're telling your dog that I have no authority because then nothing's going to happen. I'm just going to keep on saying the same thing. If you drive by a police officer, he says, slow down. And he doesn't pull you over and give you a ticket. He does it every day. After a while, you just speed by him. You don't even pay attention because he's showing you he's not an authority figure. Enforcing rules consistently, not dispassionately, is a great way to demonstrate to the dog that you are acting like a leader. And even though I might not like it at first, it's comforting for somebody else to be in charge. You have to worry about the big picture. That's kind of, I think, one of the things that's going on with these dogs. So petting with purpose is telling the dog to, pet, to do something before you pet it. Um, either it tells you to pet it or you just want to pet it, you make it pay for it first. Or the dog prepays for the attention. Use the word paycheck if somebody's petting without a purpose as a reminder. Um, and the other side of the coin is what I call passive training, which is recognizing and rewarding desired behaviors when they happen organically. So every time the dog comes to you, pet it and say, here. Every time it sits down next to you, pet it and say, sit. Every time it lays down, pet it and say, crash. Uh, brings you a special toy, name each toy. Now, if every time your dog stretches, you can stretch and, and pet and say stretch. I taught my dog to grumble this way. 
You do anything your dog does that does repeatable that's unusual, you can train them to do it on command by marking it within that three second window and popping it and giving them a treat or a reward. Remember, dogs look through repetition, consistency, and good timing. You have three seconds to correct or reward the dog for them to have the ability to make the connection. It has to be repeated over and over again. As humans, we tend to think of breaking a rule as a positive or as a reward, but for dogs, that's confusing because they're probing to see, am I allowed to go on this carpet at daytime, nighttime, all the sides of the carpet? And once I probed enough and you've always been consistent, then I'm going to say, I'm just not allowed to go on the couch. But then at the, at the end of the month, we say, hey, you, know, you haven't tried for a while. Why don't you come up and get on the couch? That just confuses the heck out of them. So have a long period of time before they try, without them trying to do it, at, before you start inviting them back up, if you are going to at all. Um, all right, so we also talked about, uh, what else did we talk about? The yard. Um, the dogs don't like to come in from outside. Um, so one of the things, and I have a lot of people, there's a girl I was starting to see for a while that had the same thing. She would go shake a box of milk bones by her back door. The dog would come in. She would close the door and not give the dog a milk bone. She's training the dog, don't trust me. I'm going to try to fool you, and there's no reward. So if I, tr if I want the dog to come to me, I'm calling the dog and I'm saying, come. Well, the dog knows that by coming, it's giving, in, giving me what I want. By withholding that, it retains a little authority. Also, I probably condition the dog not to come in because a lot of times we ask the dog to come in, it's because they're barking at the neighbor and we don't want them to be a bad neighbor. And so we call them in. They're like, I was having a great time yelling at the, at the squirrel in the tree. You asked me to come inside. Now I can't yell at the squirrel. Next time, I'm just not going to listen to you because your commands mean no more fun. Well, what we do is we take that baggage away. So since the dog doesn't come in from outside, go out with the guardians and go outside, have a high value training treat or a couple, and walk to the middle of the yard and don't say anything. Just wait there. Don't look at the dog. Don't try to entice them. Don't show you about a treat. Because again, that's putting the leadership, you know, the, the, the power in their position. So just wait, hang out, pull out your phone or have a magazine, read it. And when one of the dog comes up to you, give it a treat. I recommend change the word from come to here because the guardian has been using that word for too long. And we're eating it. So the dog comes at its own volition. You give it a treat and say, here. And then you turn around and go back inside. And let's say we're 20 paces into the yard when the, when the dog came to us. Next time, I wait about five minutes, go back in the yard and repeat it. And this time, I only go 19 feet out in the yard. The first dog comes, I give it a treat and say, here. And then I walk back inside. Remember, every time you give a treat, the treat should go in the mouth first. They should hear the command immediately after. And then next time you wait five minutes and we'll go out there this time, maybe you're 18, 17, 16. Eventually you're on the deck, on your stairs, right, eventually you're right by the door. And eventually we go out there, all three dogs will come up right away. Because it, now it doesn't represent the end of playtime. It represents come to the human, get a treat. Now, if only one dog comes at first and the other dog, two dogs come, don't come right away, just give one treat. If all three dogs give at the same time give, and they're giving the same performance, then I would reward all of them at the same. But if you give one dog a treat and you're like, come, come here. Again, you're putting that dog in the driver's seat and you're disrespecting the first dog who obeyed and listened to you. So first dog to come gets the reward. Whoever comes second doesn't get a damn thing unless they show the same effort as the first dog that would pay them based on performance. And eventually the dogs will just come right up to you. When they're coming all the way to the door, the next step is have them come to the door, give them a treat, and then close the door and let them go back to play. And after they're coming without any hesitation, then every once in a while throw a treat inside the house when they go to the side in the house to look, get it, look it up and say casa or kitchen or home or house or whatever the word is that you want to mean to come inside. And then, but don't do it every time. So now sometimes they come and I, I get a treat and then they get to go back outside. Sometimes they don't. If your dog is really having problems with, this, uh, with them not wanting to come through the door, have them come all the way inside, give them the treat, leave, leave the door open and let them go back outside. So that way, in one of those days when you do want them to come inside, because they are barking at the neighbor, you have them come inside, they're programmed to come inside, you give them a treat and close the door before they can go back outside. So now, yeah, it's a buzzkill, but now it's only like once a day when out of 100 times I go to them on their own and for passive training, they're petting me and say the word here, or they're going out in the yard and as soon as I come to them, I get a treat and then I get to continue playing. So we take away that baggage and the negative association with coming to them represents the end of fun time. And also, don't do any snatching of the dogs. If the dog is he showing hesitant, it's leaning over its leg to try to take a treat and then running away, it's telling you, I don't trust you because you've proven to me that you're not trustworthy because you've snatched me, you've tricked me, you've fooled me. So we don't want to do those things. We want the dog to want to do the things. So the, the descri description I just went over the yard creates a positive association. And by the time the dog comes back in, it's probably probably practiced 40, 50 treats. And every time it gets to go back and play. And then try to, when you're doing this, try to wait for the dog to come to the door on its own rather than calling it. When you do notice it there, go over, open the door, show it you got a treat, throw the treat on the ground, it comes in the house. It already wanted to come in the house, so we're not influencing it so much that way. They come in and get a treat, and then we close the door. 
And that way we're not calling it a come, 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 come. Um, let me see, what else did we go over? Potty training is something I wanted to go over uh, for Rosie. Um, the guardians don't let her downstairs because she's not reliable. And now if there are a lot of stains downstairs, you need to make sure that they're cleaned with an enzyme. You cannot cover up urine stains, and dogs will typically go where they've smelled other dogs or they've gone themselves. If you just febreze it or clean it up, but you haven't used the enzyme, it's probably something in there. Sometimes it gets into the, into the uh, padding, and that's really hard because it sits there, and it, it's like a big neon sign for the dog to go and pee there. So the first thing we want to do is make sure that that's completely cleaned up so the dog's not being attracted to the same place. Also, um, does the dog have a command word to potty? Potty, be good girl. Okay, so be a good girl. I'm pretty sure the guardians are saying be a good girl at other times. So that confuses the dog. I often often ask my clients, do you know if do you speak Spanish? And they say no. And I say, do you know uh, what if I say PNS said to you? Do you know what that means? And they're like, uh, no. What if I say it to you a hundred times? Does that help you understand what I mean? And they're like, no. I'm like I can say it one more time and have you instantly understand what PNS said means. PNS said. What do I mean? I mean, I'm always like, are you thirsty? You want a drink? Yes, that's exactly what it means. I just put it in context. So when your dog is outside peeing or pooping, you want to just go outside and follow her around. And just say it with about 10 feet, but don't tell her potty. And come up with a completely new word, because potty and be a good girl probably is too many words. Dogs key on the first word that you say, so it should be a one-word command and a funny command. So if, you, if, you're, uh, if you're into polit politics and you don't like Trump, call it Trump. If you don't like the other side of the aisle, call it Clinton or whatever you want to do. And so you come up with a funny command word that kind of creates a chuckle because everybody in the house probably is on one side of the political aisle or the other. Or whatever it is. Maybe there's an Uncle Larry that we don't like Larry. We say Larry every time the dog poops. Um, and so that way you create that funniness, but it's a completely unique word. So the idea is we go outside. As soon as the dog starts to pee or poop, you say Larry. And say it like that. A lot of people would go, Larry! And that'll stop the dog from pottying. Both dogs in here got up. So you want to say it just, Larry, when the dog, within three seconds, the dog's starting to pee or poop. Same word for both, both actions. When it gets done, you crouch down and hold your hand out with a treat. And when the dog licks it up, you say the word Larry again. So the first time I hear Larry is when I'm pooping or peeing. And then later on, I hear Larry when a delicious treat's on my mouth. After a while, those three things become kind of a triangle or all synced up and analogs for each other. Well, then that way, if I tell my, if I think my dog has a potty and I say Larry, the dog goes, then I know it's a yes. If I say Larry, the dog looks at me, I know that's a no. So that way we put things in context and made it easier. Now, the three times the dog's most apt to need to go is right after waking up about five minutes after eating and at 15 minutes after the start of heavy playtime. Also, if a dog starts sniffing the ground, kind of doing figure eights and walking back and forth in the same area, they're trying to look for a spot to go. So making sure we take the dog out and put it in the right place when it needs to go is really helpful. We talked at the beginning of the bus, uh, about starting an exercise journal. I would write down the time that you feed the dog and the time that it pees or poops and whenever possible in the journal. You won't catch all of them, but you catch some of them. After a while, you'll recognize what your dog's digestive tract is. You're like, you know, every time, you know, she's going to poop between 11 and 11.45. So during that time, we're watching the dog a little bit more clear, clearly. And once the dog's pooped, then we can take, let the dog have more access in the house. It's unloaded, so to speak. The things you never want to do, never get mad at a dog if you catch it having an accident. What you want to do is slap the wall or something, get the dog to pay attention to you, and then take it outside. Uh, or rubbing the dog's nose in it or getting mad at it are two things that are two of the worst things you can do because it teaches the dog, the human gets mad when I potty or they're going to rub my nose in it. And guess what? i got to potty like six times a day. So instead of telling you so you can let me outside, I'm going to go hide behind the couch so you don't rub my nose in it or get mad at me for doing it. It's one of the biggest problems I have in California with people who get angry with their dog. They're always like, okay, I won't potty in front of you. Well, guess what? We're in California. Most people in Los Angeles don't have a yard. So you have to walk your dog to pee, and the dog's like, I'm not peeing in front of you. You get angry when I do this. I had one client had to tie their dog to a tree and go around the corner, wait for the dog to pee, and come back. So don't ever rub your dog's nose in it or get angry. If you catch them in the act, clap your... I don't even like clapping because I want them to come for that. I'd slap the wall or something to distract them and then immediately take them inside. Positive reinforcement is the way to go. Uh, but make sure you get it cleaned up first because if you don't, then it's just so attractive. I'm just going to go back and keep on doing that over and over again. Um, anything else that I have that I have circled that we were going to go over? I had the cardio might be exam, but I think I remembered all of them this time. A yard mouthing. Oh, mouthing. Okay. So Hank likes to come up and nip and mouth his guardians, and they think it's he's, it's playful. One of the things that puppies learn in our puppy classes is what we call bite inhibition, that it feels good to, for a dog to bite or nip others, but it doesn't feel so good to be on the receiving end. 
Dogs don't realize that because they're the ones nipping. This is why puppy class is helpful because they nip other puppies. They yelp and they both freeze for a second. Uh, make sure that he has plenty of good chew things. When dogs are stressed or bored, they like to chew on things. Your dog should have at least 30 toys. And they should be a variety of different items. Don't get just balls. Um, you should. I like antlers. I like water buffalo horns. A water buffalo horn, make sure that the walls of it are fairly thick or the thing is solid, otherwise it'll splinter it. But that'll probably outlast the dog. And it will. the water buffalo horn will smell nasty for about a week. And after that, it won't have the smell. Just put up with it for a week because it'll probably outlast the dog. Um, I also like Nyla bones, which are rigid plastic. They don't have any bend. They come in different flavors. You can get bacon or barbecue. Don't get the chicken one, though, because that tastes like everything. Just a joke. Uh, but get different flavors of those and different shapes. A lot of us get the bone that looks like the skeleton cartoon bone. No actual bone looks that way. So get some that look, I have one that looks like a forearm, one that's a letter Y that I got on Amazon, one that's kind of a donut, um, one that's a Tyrannosaurus. Um, so giving these different uh, shapes and sizes and textures and colors and flavors gives the dog more uh, in variety. Well, just like us, we play a video game. After a while, we get tired of playing that game. So you want a bunch of different variety. Uh, uh, let me see. I also would get real bones and I would get some Kongs and fill the Kongs with peanut butter and put it one of the meat. Uh, I use chicken liver. I use tricky trainers, chicken liver treats, uh, the soft ones. Uh, the smell of the food is the most important thing for a dog. Temperature is second, taste is distant third. So for a Kong, what I do is take one of the chicken livers and I put it in the Kong. There's a hole at the bottom, a tiny little hole, let air go out so it doesn't create a vacuum. Then fill that sucker up with peanut butter. And then now your dog has to work through all the peanut butter to get that little meat treat at the bottom. Um, and when it comes to Kongs, red, uh, black are stronger than red. So if you notice your dog's just showing red, get black. Uh, but I uh, used to have, like, I'd have, after a while I'd start freezing them. And that makes it harder for the dog to get it out. So if you're going to have a guest come over and you pull out a Kong or a bully stick or a, a kneecap or a trachea or a cow's cheek, don't use raw hides. They're soaked in bleach and ammonia, a lot of other nasty chemicals. Uh, but if every time a guest comes over, we do the bat training, and then after the bat training is done, then we go over and give the dog a bully stick, a dried bull's penis, or a kneecap or something like that. And then the guest is here. Now the dog is practicing being distracted. It's And it... Every time a guest comes over, I get like a really good, tasty thing to chew on. And after enough repetition, the dog starts to practice, just to look forward to people coming over because I'm getting good stuff. Now, um, the guardians, I showed them how to do bat training. I didn't go through it all intense. And, and bat training really gets a lot of people in trouble because they think it's so simple. All I'm doing is just throwing stuff on the ground, letting the dog lick it up. The whole point is we don't want the dog to react. We put the stuff on the ground as a distractor to help the dog be focused on something other than what they're fearful or reactive to. But we also want to practice calling them away. And there's a lot of different variables for it, set up things that we can do to set the dog up for success. So we might need to set something up in the future to work on a bat training session, maybe have a guest or somebody come over and show the guardians some other steps and things that we can do with bat training. Um, now, if I forgot anything uh, to go over anything here, um, or if you have questions or things stop working, please call them or text me. If I don't hear from you, I assume that means everything's going great. Um, uh, I'd love to call with every client after, uh, as much as I wanted, but after when having thousands of clients, I just don't have the time, unfortunately. Um, texting is the fastest way to reach me. Text me a picture of the dog. Hey, you helped us with Hank, and I have a couple quick questions about this, that, and the other thing. And if you don't hear back from me, it's not that I'm being personal. I am very, very, very busy. I'm literally grinding 16 hours, 14 to 16 hour days uh, now that I've lost my assistant, and I don't have enough time, and I'm stressed myself. So if you hear, don't hear back from me in a day or two, follow up again. I probably just got distracted. I want to help you. It's not that I don't want to, but sometimes I only have so many hours in the day. Uh, okay, Luna, R Rosie, I would invite Hank over, but he's outside. You can hear him. He's complaining. He's not getting these treats. All right. Well, this, Hank is outside. You saw him earlier in the video. This is Luna. Sit. This is Rosie. You probably can't see. This is on a tripod. And I'm David. And uh, this, is the, uh, this is Hank, Luna, and Rosie's Roadmap to Success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog. Only sometimes you mean it.